Hi, this is Barry, and welcome to the Simplicity Zen podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, if you could take a moment and click su subscribe and then the alert button, I'd appreciate it. Um, and the reason why I ask is um, I'd like to have this kind of distributed to more people. And the main way that YouTube decides how widely to distribute a, a um, YouTube channel is based on number of subscriptions. And so um, you'd be helping me. And plus, uh, my kids get excited when I get more subscriptions. So there's that. Um, so today, my guest is James Muon Ford. Am I saying that right? A lot, of, a lot of times during these podcasts, I, I, I realize I'm coming across words that I've read a thousand times, but never pronounced before. <laughs> I get tripped up. But um, So he's a Zen teacher uh, with Dharma Transmission in both Soto Zen and the Harada Yasutani lineages. Um, he is also a semi-retired Unitarian Universalist minister. Is semi-retired after it, do you think? It seems like I, you still do some, right? I still do some things, right? Uh -huh. um, he's had leadership roles in both the Lay Zen Buddhist group, I mean, the American um, Buddhist Association, and also the Soto Zen Buddhist Association. And he's currently the guiding teacher for Empty Moon Zen. He's the author of several books, including Zen Master Who, and an introduction to Zen Koans, learning the language of dragons. Thank you so much for being here with us today. If I if I could, uh, so I'm a member of the uh, Soto Zen Buddhist Association and the American oh. Zen Teachers Association. I I am an honorary member of the Lay Zen Teachers oh, Association. Okay. Yeah. But I, which uh, part of the thing that's really I find just sweet is that they they made me one when they formed, uh, uh, um, um, which I took as a, 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 you know, a, a kind gesture. And I, I certainly am a big fan of Householders Zen. Yeah, you know, it's weird. I'm, I'm not really sure I know what lay Zen is. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm, a, or, I'm ordained, you know, technically speaking, you know, I'm, I'm ordained in a lineage that goes back to Dogen and, you know, and Rujin before that. Yeah, I live in a house. I have a salary I have a wife, I have kids. We have eight snakes. You know, we, you know, I mean, I'm living a lay householder life, you know, if, you know, if you, and if you look at the word, what monk, you know, what's translated as monk, it really means literally beggar, you know, you know bis, bisku or whatever, you know, I think that's a word I've not pronounced before, but just read, you know, and, and so, I mean, I'm curious, what do you, what do you think lay Zen is versus ordained or like, what is the distinction? Yeah, well, well, I, I I think it's a mystery unfolding, um, um, but but it's it's a it's been a, 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 I, I tend not to use lay because it implies there's a lay and there's a professional and you know and and I know householders who are you know um, among the more important Zen teachers of you know of our time, um, so I use householder as a, a, a distinction, but but the. Uh, um, um, when Zen emerges in in early medieval China uh, uh, from the founding myths, you know, you know, where where history and story are not not really very easily untangled, uh, there is Dharma transmission, an acknowledgement of some kind of insight that is given to ordained people and is given to householders. Um, um, the the protectors of of the way have been the monastic community you know and the guardians and the gatekeepers you know often but but there are there have always been householder teachers then um but it would but the other the other alternative were monastics and vinaya monastics people that we would recognize as monks or nuns even in our western culture celibate people living under rule um, japan everything gets gets wackadoodle uh, um, complicated historical things um the, the the and a long evolution by the beginning of the the by the beginning of the 20th century certainly there's there's um a, a class of people who are are more like uh, ministers uh, they're, they're they're the te they're temple priests okay. they have a monastic formation period mm -hmm. most of them marry um and and it, it, and they have not yet worked out what that means in in japan they use monastic language there's a men, mona, there's kind of a conceit of being monks 
when there are spouses and children and uh, um, bills to be paid. Uh, um, that was in, that's the primary lineage to come to the lineage families to come to the West. And so you and I, you know, we're, you know, we both had monastic experiences in our lives, um, but we don't live that way. And, and so what is, so what are we, the, the, the language I have preferred uh, for that kind of person is priest rather than uh, um, um, monk or, or, or nun. And, and so we fulfill sacerdotal functions, you know, classic priestly stuff, you know, we, we create merit and transfer it, uh, um, officiate at, at rites of passage and, you know, and in communities are often seen as people to go to for, for various forms of, of, of counsel and, and guidance. Householders can do Actually, householders can do any of that. Um, generally, uh, there is no interest in the, you know, in the in the more traditional uh, sacerdotal functions that you find in Japanese and, but among householder teachers, but not necessarily. Yeah. You know, so I I hope that wasn't too arcane. But no, that's good. This Are is, you familiar with um, Nelson Foster up at Ring of Bones, Endo? Of course, he's he's my Dharma uncle. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, and so he, he's an interesting case, you know, so he, uh, I practiced there for a while, you know, it ended up being just too far, you know, for me to really kind of dig into the community, but, uh, you know, driving distance. Um, but, you know, he's really interesting. So he lives in a rural mm -hmm. cabin, basically right next to the temple. You know, his full-time profession is being a Zen teacher. He right. wears robes. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, he's you know, his entire life revolves around the Dharma. I mean, just entirely, as far as I can tell, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's a lay, you know, he's in the lay Zen teacher association. He's, he right. self-identifies as a lay teacher. But then I know right. ordained Soda priests who, you know, have full-time jobs, have kids, you know, live in a house, you know, so it's, so it's really interesting how it's so, you know, we're, we're, possible, we're, you know. We're in a period of a hundred flowers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And we don't know how it's gonna how it's gonna come out, um, for sure. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about um, uh, your current group, um, uh, Empty Moon Zen? Like what what that yeah. is? You yeah. Know. So so um, as I came to the end of my professional life outside of Zen as a Unitarian minister, um, um, I was in New England, deeply involved in a, in a network of Zen communities there. So um, boundless Way Zen? Boundless Way. Mm -hmm. and, and I, uh, um, as we were looking at retirement, we realized that we needed to return to California to be near Jan, my spouse's uh, mom, who uh, turns 95 in, a, in two months. And, and to be be supportive for for her and be present and and so um, and we're native Californians. It was kind of nice to come home uh, to the land of earthquakes and fires and mudslides, and and uh, uh, we're, we we settled in here. A, a couple of small communities gathered around my my style of practice. Um, we call ourselves uh, Empty Moon Zen. Um, there's a sitting group in, in Seattle tied up with the University Unitarian Church. There's a, um, um, an online group uh, that's run out of Oakland. And then uh, we had a couple of groups that, that, that died out in, in the plague. Um, we stopped paying rent and and you know actually at this point what was it just a few few months ago i was realizing oh well you know we're all pretending the the covet has re, you know receded and um um maybe it's time to start calendaring a, an in-person retreat mm -hmm. and i realized you know i don't wanna <laughs> I'm happy to attend. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, be a, a guest teacher. I'm happy to sit, but I'm not going to organize nothing. And so, so the the seniors within the Empty Moons Inn are kind of reorganizing themselves, even as we speak. I believe we're going to emerge as the Empty Empty Moon Zen Sanghas, and um, um, I will be. I don't know. I think they're going to call me founding teacher or something. And they're my community. They're 
the communities I practice with, and I'll continue to be working with my 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 the people I've already made a commitment to, but I won't be adding any students. Uh, so I'm you know you know I turned seventy four in two months as well, and you know it's, I'm seeing the uh, the 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 writing on the wall for my uh, uh, abilities to run things. Uh, so so it's kind of you know an interesting phase of life. When you guys moved to um, online, you know, when the when the plague started, did you are you doing co-on work online? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we work with people who, uh, you know, kind of a conventional Doxon. I mean, you can create a it's easy to create a Doxon room uh, online. And I, I say as if I knew how to do it, but but my my friends know how to do it. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's really hard to enter koan introspection unless you have you know a settled practice and uh and it is a little bit more problematic if 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 you're beginning practice um in in this kind of isolation without the the stinky flesh you know around you um generally speaking i don't find koan introspection really works for people who are unable to do some kind of retreat um you know you need some some you know uh container uh to to get to get started and then but you know if you're a senior practitioner if you've been doing koans for for a few years especially if you've entered into the the the, the you know the style of it you can do it online yeah good is that something you guys started because of COVID, or were you already doing that yeah i you know we did it because of COVID. you know i mean it, it was it was it was theoretically possible you know then it became a you know a necessity and then looked pretty good and you know now we have you know just about two years worth of experience of it uh you know a koan koan practice koan introspection as i see it is uh for me it's critical but it's it's you know what do you say what do they say uh um necessary but not sufficient uh there are other things that are necessary and, for the waking up and growing up and the other threads of making who it is that we are as a human being. Coens are no good for growing up, I've noticed. Uh, the, oh, Coens are no good for growing up. Yeah, yeah they, I mean, they're just irrelevant to, the, to, the, to, to that matter. Uh, and sometimes they make a, the, the only problem is when people think that that, that is somehow implicitly, you know, superior. Um, it's, it's not the way it is. What, what what do you think the um this is going off tangent a little bit but what what do you think the relationship is between awakening and psychological maturity are they totally irrelevant uh, i don't think they're totally irrelevant um um psychological you know and social maturity you know two intertwining things not necessarily you know i think they they, they it's kind of hard to see them in isolation um, I would say awakening, especially if we're talking about a house, householder context, if we're outside of a monastery. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of things that, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in duty and responsibility and something that, you know, is not well, well thought out in, in, in thin. There's kind of this cosmic vow, um, um, but, uh, you know, we've got a lot of vows to keep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that come just with the fact that we breathe. Um, I, I do believe awakening provides a context that, you know, because the boundlessness is kind of pregnant. There's some, you know, you can really look at it as, as a radical interdependence as well. I mean, you don't want to get stuck in any one image, but, but that, that intuition that, you know, we birth out of the same place, you know, is also an intuition. We're a family, you know, and, and we, and things and people and the world have claims, claims on us. And especially if we're living in, in the world. So you as a teacher, when you're looking at making teachers, I imagine you're looking at both, you know, their Dharma eye being open as well as psychological and social maturity. Is it, would that be correct? Well, I, I don't know if I'm, uh, you know, how successful I've been at that. That's the. But I mean, is that at least the, I mean, is that part of the consideration? Well, it is today. Uh, uh, 
uh, you know, it's a growing, it's a growing edge. I, you know, my, my, my initial, uh, well, my way back, well, even when I began with, you know, even though I was a Soto monastic, uh, um, you know, in my childhood, it was with, you know, with a teacher who professed to be about awakening as well, um, had a different set, skill sets, but, but, but that was part of the deal. And definitely, and then by, you know, as I turned towards uh, Cohen introspection practice and um, um, awakening was the deal, you know, you know and ab absolutely. And it was, you know, there were, you know, like Aitken Roshi was sitting in the background and, you know, and, and his heavy, so, you know, social justice focus, but, um, and, you know, and I had an affinity with that, but, but I didn't have a well thought through connection and, and it, you know, Growing up takes a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, so kind of going way back, you know, kind of rewinding a bit, but going back to uh, your childhood, can you talk a little bit about where you grew up and what your family was like and so forth? Sure. Sure. Um, um, so uh, I'm, I was born in Oakland, California in 1948. And um, my father was uh, kind of a, a, a ne'er-do-well. So, so we, we, we moved frequently. I don't believe I went to a single school for two years uh, as a child. Oh, wow. um, often, you know, my, you know, um, kind of my joke is is that you know I didn't even know that people moved during the day, uh, um, and and uh, so it was, it was chaotic. You know, on the other hand, there was kind of a loving quality to it. Um, um, you know, for for you know. For, for a ne'er do well and a drunk and everything, he was also you know, a loving parent, uh, and and so I had this kind of little co tight little my, my brother, my mother, my father, and my maternal uh, uh, aunt and grandmother and um, um, and her husband and grandfather. Um, we would often live together. We would often butt off, and then we would come back together. Um, um for various reasons um Any siblings one my 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 brother yeah a year younger than me and um and did you so you stayed in the barrier the whole time pretty much oh no 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 he can track you down if you stay that close uh uh, uh, um, mainly up and down the California coast, but but um, we also spent some time in New York. I um, mainly in my in the younger years. I like I have no tactile memories, but I have kind of a visual memory of snow and um, uh, Florida as well. Briefly, uh, at some point, my father had a, kind of a, he, he was very badly wounded in the Second World War, and, and there was some kind of there, there in addition to a, a, a small pension, which was. Thank goodness. Um, there was also a uh, um, some kind of cash. He came into some cash, and he and my my maternal grandfather bought a farm in Missouri. And it, it only took them a year to you know to to wreck it. But but I do have a you know a, probably a manufactured dream because people just kept telling the story of um, jumping into the pig pen to play with the piglets and. Um, maternal grandfather uh, um, jumping in and grabbing me and jumping out just ahead of mama you know, so otherwise funny. I have a very similar story involving bulls oh okay yeah yeah um, so was there any uh, religious context to this was your family religious um, did you guys go to church yeah my mother my so on my mother's side and the whole my maternal grandmother's our spiritual um, leader um, um uh, fundamentalist christians and my father was an robert ingersoll agnostic scoffing atheist um, um um so that was the kind of the tension between the uh, the two my i have an enormous respect for my maternal grandmother as my first teacher um, literally taught me how to read out of the King James Bible, big illustrated volume sitting on her lap. And, um, 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 you know, and she was a spirit filled woman and, uh, you know, and lived with spirits. And uh, so, so that was part of my childhood. In adolescence, I embraced the, uh, you know, the, the scoffing atheist for a while. But, but so there's a while you, you believed in God and it all seemed real to you. And well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, my first, my first belief, you know, was my first thought that I was going to be a, you know, a missionary, uh, and uh, um, 
um, yeah, yeah, ministry was what I was supposed to do. And, uh, you know, but, you know, um, puberty came and, you know, and, you know, and all sorts of madness. And, you know, yeah, and, and, you know, and, and I, you know, began to embrace the scientific worldview, uh, which I've never not unembraced. Um, um, it's a little richer, maybe, but, but, uh, um, um, but that was, yeah, so I could never, you know, I could, the last time I was in, in a, a fundamentalist Christian church was at my grandmother's funeral. You know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll talk to Christian friends and they'll describe the Holy Spirit. And it sounds an awful lot of what maybe Zen people would call Samadhi. Did you, do you think you had any of those kind of proto Samadhi experiences in the early church years or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there was a, you know, there's a linguistic thing. There's a, I mean, there's a pretty sharp dualism in the received Christianity I practiced in. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it did not, you know, it, it had stripped away all the mystical trend, you know, things. I mean, they're mystical in the woo-woo sense it was there, but mystical in the, you know, in the uh, um, effacement and in, in the divine. Um, yeah, and we were perfectionists, not 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 uh, Pentecostal, so, so uh, 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 which brought its own problems. Uh, but 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 you know, I'm I'm respectful. I I I'm, I consider it, uh, myself, you know, a, a child of the Christian tradition. Um, I'm very fond, you know, I'm seminary trained. I uh, um, have many Christian friends, and I. I certainly consider myself culturally Christian. I, uh, although I have to admit, when I get nostalgic and I think, well, I could, I could do the Christian thing. All, all I have to do is go to a Christian church Sunday service. <laughs> yeah, especially, especially these last couple of years. Last couple of years, uh, I'm enormously fond of the Episcopalians. I think that they they're the true faith and virtue of the of the of the Christian way. Awesome. Uh, yeah. I love. Um, so as a teenager, were you happy? Brodian, you know, like what, what kind of like, come what, like, like what was kind of the alley oop, you know, the setup for you getting into practice, kind of as a young man, were you oh, suffering turmoil for you, or I, you know, discovering my father was a criminal uh, um, was not a happy thing. Um, um, uh, 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 poverty was not a happy thing. Uh, um, uh, uh, I, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, I, when, when I, when I heard that life is Duca, I said, well, well of course it is. Uh, uh, the turning thing for me, my, my initial koan was, is God real? Um, and, 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 um, you know, um, um, and that was my question. And that, that led me, that is what led me on the, on the path. Yeah. Um, did you, so did you go to college? No, I was a high school dropout. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you're kind of at the age of, of gotten into the hippie stuff where you, did you ever? Oh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That at all? Well, I thought the psych psychedelics would save the world for, you know, about 15 minutes. Uh, actually, it was when I realized that that was not the case, you know, that, uh, um, um, that I started looking around in the seriously in the, in the spiritual, uh, you know, options of the time I, I was in interested in Vedanta primarily through the lit literary side from, from, from the, 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 those English expats, Hollywood expats who, who were cranking out, um, interesting books, uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, Gerald Hurd, um, Christopher Isherwood, most of all, and the Theosophists. Uh, you know, I never, I, I like the idea of the gossip of the Theosophists, but I didn't have a my 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 uh, uh, personal disposition. Just couldn't go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I was I was more aware of how, the exposés of Madame Blavatsky than her teachings. Um, and plus, you know, it really sucks when the when you discover Matria and they end up being a a spoiled brat and won't do it. Well, well, that's true. That's true. Uh, although it, I kind of I find I find Christian Murdy really interesting since yeah. kind of practic uh, Buddha. You know, yeah. I'd yeah. say. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. Fascinating story, and yeah. and and somebody who ends up, uh, you know, you know, they said he was going to be a world teacher, and I think he he came close. You know, yeah. uh, 
yeah. just not the, quite the way they they kind of hoped. Yeah, and I mean, if you, you know, spending five minutes inside, um, you know, the Soto Zen group and Facebook, you can see how profoundly in, um, influential he is on the way people talk about spirituality and stuff. In probably ways they don't even understand where they're right come from. You know, there's definitely a, a, a thread of of Zen Buddhism that you see particularly on social media that um, um, is is fed by by you know. Um, Echoes of Alan Watts and Krishnamurti, and and um, you know, for those who read a little bit, you know, D.T. Suzuki, and and it's not without merit, um, but 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 it is without practice. <laughs> yeah, and you know, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of gaseous, uh, uh, um, you know, pomposities out there. Uh, so, so your psychedelic experiences did they? Were they of a kind of a mystical or spiritual nature? Did you perceive them that way at the time? Um, um, very quickly, it was entertainment. Um, I started thinking it was spiritual. Um, I, I, my, from t my perspective today is I believe psychedelics open one door, um, and that is into seeing the world is not the way we think it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a super important you know thing to realize. Um, yeah. I don't see a second lesson there. I don't see anything deeper or more. I mean, it's, that's deep and it's profound and it's really a gift. But, but I don't. I, I, I have not observed it. People I respect say that there that that you can do more. And I think in other, you know, in uh, in other cultural contexts, I, I could see how that would be true. In ours, you know, I haven't seen much techno shamanism that seemed to be, you know, um, particularly you know compelling to me. And you know, I, I want to be you know, you know, all religions are false. So you know, you know, and all religions uh, seem to open doors. So I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to personally close any door that might work for 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 somebody. I haven't seen it working though. Yeah, and and if you think about it, I mean, even even organic Kensho experiences are just an opening of a door. They're not, you know, it, so I don't know why people think LSD experiences would be any different, you know. Well, yeah, and and Kensho hopefully you know is contextual. You know, I mean, it actually allows us. You know, I I mean, and that's what Zen's gift is: is that there is a context within which you know everybody has awake. Everybody can have awakening experiences, and if they're true, they're they're human. You know, and and they are not bound by a religious tradition. Um, um, uh, but some religious traditions help a little more, and uh, and I I have found in my life, Zen Buddhism providing a uh, you know more helpful and less harmful uh, um, guidelines along the way. Yeah, I mean, I think you're more well read than me, so you can maybe validate the statement I'm about to make. But it seems Zen almost might be singular in the world of recognizing the importance and specializing in post awakening practice like i like you know you look at all the non duality groups it yeah. all seems to end with the awakening whereas zen that's more just kind of the beginning you know, yeah or sudden you know like i think you're right i think you know post and show uh, training is like a is is a, it's a hallmark of 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 koan introspection practice um you know in, in the various ways that you know the the orthodox rinzai has a very you know um um, um long path there our own hybrid uh um harada yasatani line you know i mean most of it's post Kensho, you know, uh, and and yeah, and I don't know anybody else who 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 does it at that that level. Um, certainly, in the in the uh, kind of um, in the way that we in the way that we do it, I I wouldn't be surprised that you know on Mount Athos there are some people who who can guide people pretty far down the line, and you know, and I no doubt there are other you know you know other ways as well. So I remember reading, an, I don't know if it was an interview or one of your blog posts, but you were living in the Bay Area, and I think you were practicing at Berkeley Zen Center, and you, you, or you were living in the East Bay, and then you checked out uh, San Francisco Zen Center, and it, it just seemed too big for you. Or, am I remembering this correctly? Like, well, how, well I, I like that version. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, 
I, when it was time to start looking for 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 a practice community you know I'm, you know i'm like 17 and and uh i you know um people keep pushing me towards shenra suzuki yeah and and uh finally i decided to do it and you know actually my girlfriend and i dropped acid and hitchhiked over to the the city and fortunately didn't make it uh, the next week because they had these saturday introductions uh bus without any additional help and um got run through the 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 basic stuff uh, and claude ananda dallenberg who was you know one of the one of the people there gave me the basic instructions uh um thrown into a, a one minute doxan with with uh, Katagiri sensei at the time and uh, um, and given a little sheet of paper with the names and addresses of affiliate, you know, the half dozen affiliates or however many they had at the time. And one of them was Berkeley. So yeah. I was this late 60s or in this late, late 60s. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I I sat about a year uh, um, pretty close to daily moved into a little house across from the Berkeley Zendo and um, um, but it was big and I was young and I was foolish and you know and it seemed they wanted a lot and I, I somehow I got in my head that if I were a priest all my problems would be fixed and uh, um, then um, Jiu Kinnett who was an English uh, uh, woman who moved to Japan and studied uh, Soto Zen and and you know arrived um after um finishing her her training and spending a little time as a as a temple priest um um she announced she was re she 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 moved out of she stayed at the san francisco zen center for a while then moved over into a flat on potrero hill and oh, i didn't realize she stayed at san francisco zen center. yeah yeah she, you know, she was their guest and uh um um uh, uh, and now she was receiving and I, you know, uh, I, I claim I'm her first student from in North America. Uh, Josh Barron, another person, um, um, claims he arrived before I did, but he arrived two days later. Okay. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm being a little nonlinear here, but to, to step back a little bit further, could you talk a little bit about how you discovered Buddhism itself? Was it through books? Was it through people? You know, what, what, uh, like, how did you know Buddhism existed? How did you know Zen existed? Books. I was a vor voracious reader, you know, there were, and there weren't a lot of books to read at the, in, in that moment. So, uh, uh, I think that the, the first, I, I'm pretty sure the first book that I read that, that at least the one that captured my imagination was, was, uh, three, uh, was, um, uh, um, uh, 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 reps and Senzaki, uh, uh, oh, uh, um, you made me forget it. Um, it's in yeah. flesh and bones. In flesh and bones. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> yeah and then um and then i think the way of zen uh you know alan watts. yeah alan watts was you know was like there were no other general introductions and um um yeah so you know that was kind of like with that i kind of thought oh this this seems seems interesting that with the, armed with that i could go to the san francisco zen center so why zen though i imagine you read maybe non zen buddhist books like what what zen, what about zen appealed to you uh, practice. It had an actual discipline, and I thought that might be the trick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it was uh, three pillars of Zen. It was, it was actually As talking you... about what how people practice. It wasn't just talking about what you got from practice or why you needed to practice, but actually what practice was. That, like, without question, that's what drew me in. Yeah, I loved that book when it came out, but but I had already been, I had already eaten the 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 bait, and the hook. Yeah. <laughs> And line by then. So when you met um, when you met Kenneth Kenneth Roshi, like, what was your first impression of her? Uh, I thought she's some kind of god. Yeah. Do you, Do you think there's a lot of transference on your part? You think? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, transference, projection, wish fulfillment. Uh, yeah, I remember the first time I met her. You know. Uh, a um, teacher with transmission i'm like oh my god an enlightened zen master you know i was like i'm so excited you know well you know and there weren't any i mean you know what was it there was there was uh uh um suzuki roshi 
you know, um, um, Sasaki Roshi, I'm trying to remember, he showed up somewhere around then down in LA. Uh, um, um, you know, there were like five people with, with transmission. Yeah. Okay. So it was you know, accessible in the West, you know, in North America. So when you, when you went to meet her, did you talk right away about moving in and being her student or, or would you just go to regular sittings occasionally or like how, how fast was the ramp up from not meeting her to being a student as a well, resident? You know, I guess I moved, I'm trying to remember now. I think, I think it took a month. Mm -hmm. So you were ready to go. I was ready. Good to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it, what, uh, what was the daily lifestyle like there? Was there wake up, wake up at four set service, you know, kind of what, well, yeah, like, yeah. I, I mean, when 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 she first arrived, it was straight ahead Soto Zen, you know, a monastic schedule, um, and it stayed that way for you know a while. Yeah. Did yeah. you get ordained and become an unsui right away, or was pretty, fast, pretty fast? She, um, I, I, the exact chronology, you know, eludes me. It was you know, more than fifty years ago, uh, uh, um, but but we. Uh, uh, she had to she she had family business and such to take care of in england she left one of her senior students that she brought over from japan in charge um Asian or uh, japanese uh, uh, south african okay and uh um we you know and so we, we were there then she called uh you know uh, i forget how long we were there for you know, a few months and she called and said she's coming back with you know with a dozen people and uh you know find us a place so we we found a, a large house in oakland and moved moved over to it um she showed up with her entourage and pretty soon after we had our inaugural ordinations and um that was um um you know, I was just looking and it, somehow in my mind, it's 69, uh, but maybe it was 70. Um, uh, I don't want to, if I, uh, if I start Google. Yeah. yeah. And then um, had you had any kind of session or extended um, practice experience at that point or? or uh, I, I will, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the South African only knew one way to practice. <laughs> so, so I was basically, we, I was in session for the, you know, for the nine months, six months, nine months, whatever it was leading into that. And then once we were back in, you know, we, we simply ran ongo after ongo, you know, um, it was just a, it was a monastic, monastic schedule. Then the property in Mount Shasta was acquired um soon after I, I mean i got transmission like really fast and you know like i think it was less than less than two years and and um you know then i was given my co and that was my my next co on and you were yeah. still basically a kid when you got transmission right yeah and you know and i had some experiences that you know in retrospect uh you know were real um but but you know there's no settling there's no post kensho training uh there wasn't even a a real good Kensho, uh, you know, the, the small intimations and, and, um, 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 so, you know, I left, you know, I thought it was done with this. Yeah. And, uh, you left because you thought you're done with your training or was there something about the community that wasn't driving with you or. The, the Roshi was deeply intrusive into personal lives. Uh, I found myself forced into a marriage that. Oh, really? Wow for a lot of people um and i saw and i you know and i saw if somebody left they were a villain there was you know there was just too many there was just too much um what to, you know today would call cultish behavior uh, um uh, you know complicated person genuinely had things to offer deep wounds that that you know that that i i, I intuited were a problem you know but but didn't understand and that and that was part of why you left. You just you, you it was just too culty for you. It just just was not going to be me. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I just wasn't. Uh, yeah, this was not my my uh, my life. And, uh, so, yeah. so okay. So you so you leave. You're a newly transmitted priest with no college education right. out in the world. What, what what were the next steps for you? Got a job in a bookstore. 
um, um, well, of course, and the first thing was I said, well, I, I'll just keep practicing. And of course, that took a couple of months to stop practicing. And uh, uh, then it became kind of a, a dream thing. And I started looking, you know, where, where was the path? And I, you know, I tried to, I, I looked at Christianity. I looked at, you know, Sufis and, you know, and yeah, there's a couple of, you know, um, dark years, spiritually speaking, but, but very, very driven. Then um, about the same time after, you know, three, three years or so, four years, um, I, I you know, uh, found kind of simultaneously um, um, my primary teacher was John Tarrant, who was a koan teacher, householder, and um, um, and Unitarian Universalism, you know. So the the on the Zen side of my practice, it was like a spiritual gem. You know, I went and did the practice. We did boatloads of session, but you know, there wasn't really much in between. And, you know, no community that I would call a community. Unitarian. What, what Tarrant? He didn't have much of a sangha. Is that what you mean? Um, there was a sitting sangha. You know, but you know, you can sit with people for years and not even know who they are. Yeah. True. Uh, and you know, and so yeah, and it wasn't. I mean, not a knock on him. Just the it was you know what was on offer, um, and 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 important to me. I mean, you know, I worked with him for twenty years. You know, it was really important. But it was never enough. And and for for me, the enough got filled out with the UU world. You know, which was fill, had community down pat, and. You know, no problem. You know, no spiritual comp competition. <laughs> there was no spirituality, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, so for me, they they complemented each other. It is a religious community and a spiritual practice. And, yeah. I, I want to dive into the UU stuff, but first, can you talk a little bit? About how how did you meet Tarrant? Were you looking for a teacher? Yeah. Yeah, I been so I resumed. So the Sufi group that I was sitting with, you know, gave me some kind of nominal teaching thing, and um, it was all a bad fit from the from the get go. I'm grateful for them. I mean, they're good people. Met my wife there, um, but neither of us belong there. I think if there was, you know, if, if you ever want, uh, you know, an example of you know synchronicity or something, you know, two people who really did not belong in in a you know you know in that kind of spiritual community met each other, uh, you know, which which was kind of cool. We hit our fortieth wedding anniversary uh, in June. Oh, congratulations! Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. She hasn't killed me yet. Uh, um he's a teacher in her own right if i remember right he she has a, a her teacher has given her she has you know she what's called a senior dharma teacher it's not transmission but it's a, a she 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 can do interviews with people but under close supervision with her teacher um um, um she, she doesn't really see herself as a teacher she, she's you know she's my example of you know an, a real person of zen yeah well it's kind of like the best person who the guy who's most or girl woman who's most um you know eligible or you know the person you want to be president is someone who doesn't want the job you know? yeah 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 well there you go yeah yeah and, and no matter what they tell you everybody who's a zen teacher wanted to be a zen teacher yeah uh, uh, <clears throat> but but um um I started uh, like a little Sufi study. I had, we opened a small bookstore and, and uh, um, um, the, the, uh, the Sufi group never, never happened. But I also started a sitting group and just, just have a place to sit because I, I knew I needed that practice. And it was the, you know, I, I was reclaiming it and a, uh, we were on the Russian river and, and, uh, up in Northern California and, and a, uh, um, a guy named Jim, Jim Wilson, uh, who he came to, to start sitting with us. And, you know, I quickly learned that he had been, um, he'd been a monk with, uh, Sung San Sun uh, um, the Korean master. Master and was actually a monk, a Vinaya monk, and was the abbot of their Zen center in in New York, and was on track towards Dharma transmission when he went to the teacher and said, "You know, I'm a monk because it's a good way to avoid the fact that I'm gay." And and Sung San said, uh, um, according to Jim, uh, 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 "That's okay. Just be discreet." And and. Uh, uh, 
that didn't work for Jim, you know, and, and so he had, by the time he showed up, he had taken off the robe, he had, you know, spread his oats, found a partner, was looking for a, you know, just to, you know, just to be a person and have a place to sit. Uh, he also had, um, you know, they, they do cause, you know, and, uh, and I was just, deeply interested and and i uh, asked him to do cons and he said yeah he's not really didn't have permission it's not really up his thing and i said well but you need a place to sit don't you so <laughs> so so he gave me a con he gave me he broke off what's the book cliff uh or book of equanimity you know um the second half of the line um all things return to the one uh, to what does the one return and uh, um that was my that was my very last koan. Oh, it was my very first koan. Yeah, you know? I, mean, I mean that was the koan I literally just did last Tuesday. Oh, oh, I love it. Oh, that is a hoot and a half. Yeah, you do have a different miscellaneous than we do. Yeah. Um, and and um, I knew the answer, you know. And and so we spent a year kind of going through the koans that he was willing to go through and did you know a boatload of them. And finally, he said he was done. And and so I start I look started looking for a Zen teacher and and actually actually um, an, a second kind of synchronicity thing uh, I I was working in a used bookstore I decided um, to write Robert Aitken because it looked like on on paper he was the guy for me uh, and 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 um, uh, uh, told my sad story he he. Uh, never responded <laughs> oh, really? but but the day the day i mailed the letter this the couple walk into the bookstore and the guy says uh do you have anything you know any orientalia that's unusual and and i said yeah we have a we have a uh um lafcadio her and ghost story you know with hand colored plates and and wanted to look at it and and he said, oh, I'll buy it. And because I am who I am, I said, so for yourself? And he said, no, no, a gift. And I said, oh, for whom? He said, oh, my teacher. And I said, oh, teacher of what? Yeah. And so, you know, it, it was, he was, uh, um, you know, one of John, one of Aiken Roshi's senior students. He had just come over to the mainland uh, to finish up his PhD. This is Tarrant. Uh, this is John Tarrant. And, yeah, and I met him and, you know, he's a year younger than me. You, you, you know, you could smell the danger in his aura. Uh, and, and I, you know, I actually, then Sung San went, was going to run a, a YMJJ, what they call a session, uh, and uh, in, in, Oak, in, in Berkeley. And I uh, attended it. And, you know, we kind of got on. I could answer most of the koans that he threw at me. Um, you know, it was kind of a, kind of a, nice thing but you know you know they had kimchi for breakfast and, you know, i like kimchi but you know i felt kind of i'd already had the ersatz asian experience and uh, you know and I, I just i wasn't that wasn't what i was looking for mm -hmm. i uh, uh went back and i gave john the box box of incense yeah did he have a sitting group like had you sat with him previously or did he have an established sitting group at that point um um Actually, at that point, he did not have a group, and I started one for him. Oh, I see. And um, then what, what was your, uh, so did you start back at Moo and then go down the curriculum? Like, how was your? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the quantum style is radically different than what, you know, than, than the Harati Asatani thing. And he, you know, he poked and prodded, and he started me at Moo. Yeah, and yeah, so I, I started from scratch. And uh was fine with me. I, you know, I wanted, I wanted the deal. I didn't want, you know, and, the, and there's sort of a thing I, you know, I, I metaphorically gave him my, my teaching credentials, you know, you know, I said, I would not do anything until, uh, until or unless he said I should, you know, so, you know, so I, I think the only thing he insisted, I wore a colored rock suit. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, out of respect for the past, but that was, that was it. Yeah. Oh, and then, so you mean by a brown rock suit? A brown rock suit, right? Rather than, yeah, and uh, um, um, yeah, I started a group for him there, you know, and then 
started next group when I, you know, and then we, th and then that's when Jan and I, our bookstore failed and, and we realized we were in this position. We were in our you know, mid thirties. Um, I could go to any city in the country and get a $7 an hour job. And, and she had dropped out of university to join the revolution. And, uh, at this point, uh, you know, was a typesetter, you know, working a dying trade and so we made a deal to put each other through you know, school you know get professional jobs so you went you um you went to uh theological school right yeah well first i had to get an undergraduate degree <laughs> yeah, that's my next question they require a bachelor's they required a bachelor's yeah yeah so so uh i had picked up by strictly by actually by taking night classes at, at evening college uh God bless the uh, the California Community College system, um, um, and and I guess my own nose, just following my nose, I ended up having almost a perfect undergrad, lower division fulfillment for an English major, uh, and uh, um, so uh, I was able to get into Sonoma State and get a in two years I had a a. Um, a uh, um, a bachelor's degree in psychology. And meanwhile, Jan finished up her, uh, well, and then she mainly supported me, but she took some remedial, she had two years at UCLA and, um, um, she had to do a few things. And then, um, then I got into theological school in, in Berkeley and, and she finished her undergraduate at Cal. Yeah. And then when I got my first settlement, uh, she finished her library degree. Yeah. So, so, uh, did you choose universal, um, what is it? What does you use for again? Um, Unitarian. Yeah, Unitarian Universalist. Right. Yeah. Did you, were you guys already, you said you kind of found a song there. So were you going there as a, just a pure parishioner yeah. before you decided? Just a parishioner. Um, yeah, there was a critical moment in the, uh, um, so we, we, there was a, a, the minister of the, of the, of the, uh, we were living in, in Santa Rosa at the, at the time and the minister of the church, the Unitarian church there, um, we were, you know, we, we were friends and, and at some point he said, and I was looking actually to maybe get a degree and, um, um, get, do social work or maybe, maybe, you know counseling degree and and he said at one point james you're not cut out for honest work uh you know, go to seminary and you know, right. and every and all my you know you know, that's what i wanted to be as a child yeah was it a um was it a, a uu seminary or did you just kind of go to like a regular seminary like does uu have its own seminaries yeah it it has it 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 it, it these days it has two um that are you know independent unitarian seminaries um it has one in berkeley star king school for religious leadership i think it's called um i i it's a member it was at the time i think it still is a member of the graduate theological union in, in berkeley and i i went to look at it and the same day i went to look at um the Pacific School of Religion, which is historically congregationalist, is sort of pan-denominational, uh, you know, extremely liberal, Protestant Christian seminary. And and I went to Star King first, and I just it just didn't work for me. It was you know they were they were at the fuzziest edge of fuzzy, and and I I had just discovered I could do academics, and and I really wanted a little more, you know, a little rigor. And and Pacific School of Religion was you know the oldest Protestant seminary west of the Mississippi you know and uh, and, and I still remember when I when I, when I when I went there I mean it was just really like the campus and the people I met and I saw that that part of the the formation of the Graduate Theological Union was that they when they gathered these various Protestant Catholic denominations together to create it um, part of the deal was that. Um, um, you had to surrender your library and the bulk of your library to a central library. Um, right. You also had to uh, charge, uh, um, 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 or you had to require for graduation at least one class that you didn't teach. Mm -hmm. And uh, tuition to one school was tuition to all. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like a really serious consortium. And, and, uh, 
um, and you surrendered all your academic degrees. The, the the schools only only offered the professional degree, the Master of Divinity, and the you know and um, um, and the THDs and PhDs and the MAs were all granted by the by the union, by the, you know the thing. The sole exception was that at 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 um, PSR because of its you know, because it was vastly older than all the other schools. Um, like California standards, uh, uh, um, it uh, um, it was allowed to retain an MA, you know, that could, and I, I I had this thought at the time, oh look, I can get a my MDiv, and all I have to do is do an extra year's worth of coursework and a thesis in the same three years, and I can get an academic MA as well as my professional degree, and <laughs> so. Yeah. I don't have a lot of memories about you know, about the school, but I do have you know, you know both diplomas. Uh, so, did you were you a closeted Zen Buddhist, or could you be open about it? Or uh, I was a Zen Buddhist, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I mean, that, but the very but I was a very felt comfortable talking about it. It wasn't like an awkward. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, I did, I, well, you know, the Institute for Buddhist Studies, the oldest accredited Buddhist seminary, is part of the Graduate Theological Union. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, uh, it's, that was not a deal. Uh, uh, you know, I was more interested in digging into the Christian stuff because it you know, looked really interesting. But I took a couple of classes at IBS. I took um, uh, while I was at in, at Pacific School of Religion, Masao Abe uh, was was. A, resident, you know, visiting professor for two of the three years I was there. I took everything he taught as, you know, you know, who's who, if you're not familiar with him, a major intellectual figure in the formation in the in Buddhist Christian dialogue and a kind of the last of the Kyoto school. Okay. Um, except except a little different because they had all, most of the Kyoto school people um, were academic philosophers and he was actually he you know he does doctoral work um, um uh, under paul tillich <laughs> so so you know but he's a zen guy yeah yeah so it was a yeah yeah no that was not an issue uh, um so you graduated were you able to find a position right away as a minister yeah i was part of the fair-haired crowd you know i you know, landed a landed a job in in uh um the suburbs of milwaukee mm -hmm. And what what was that like? Uh, it was awful. You know, <laughs> my first professional job. You know, you know, as a you know as a you know bookseller, you know, spiritual guy. I didn't you know you know, you know um, uh, um, I I got you know I mean I I didn't disgrace myself, but I wasn't very good. Um, but by the time I got my second calling in four years, I was I was good. Yeah. What, what is the criteria for good? Like your oratory skills, your your past, how good your well, past. yeah. I mean, you got it. Well, there's a number of things you need to do. You're preaching, absolutely, you got to be able to preach, um, and you really do have to, you know, uh, run a small nonprofit organization, and and you have to deal with, uh, you know, however many people are in that congregation who all think they're your boss. Yeah. Do you, um, were, were you doing a lot of minister, minister, ministerial stuff where you, people come to you with their problems and, you know, I mean, was, it, was there that kind of? Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Parish minister, you know, now, I mean, Unitarian Universalists are at the upper edge of, you know, education and not necessarily high income makers, but, but, but they, they're professionals and such. They, they didn't use a parish minister generally when they, you know, and they knew the difference between a psychologist and a a parish minister and i would be short i would be used for short term you know for crisis you know i mean if you know if your marriage is falling apart or somebody's dying that would be you know that's when i stepped in that's when i'd be called in for ordinary neuroses you know uh, um they had therapists yeah. did you um so my understanding of uu is there's kind of two currents one is kind of like very lightly christian and one is more almost atheist. Am I am I characterizing this correctly? You know, well, historically, it's a <clears throat> two Protestant denominations. So historically, it's Christian. Um, somewhere around the beginning, but but the transcendent the transcendentalist movement, which was a literary movement for most of America, was actually a theological dispute within Unitarianism, and 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 the and the dispute turned on the seat of authority, and and it at 
at that point, Unitarian, Unitarianism, Universalism is a separate denomination, but very closely paired, um, uh, um, ceased believing the Bible was the primary source of authority and to nature was the primary source of authority. Um, and 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 it took another hundred years for for there to be you know for by the by the beginning of the twentieth century, neither Unitarians or universes were you know were they they were nominally Christian um, associations, but but a growing current which by the middle of the twentieth century the dominant current was humanist rationalists, uh, um, the the. Uh, um, in New England, which is the the center of it all, there's a very, very light Christian uh, um, structure uh, in many of the congregations. Uh, well, I found it important actually because when when they didn't have that, you know, it was hard to see, you know, the without there, there was a yeah you know, they were good at politics, uh, you know, and they, and generally they could make good potlucks, but but um, it was a little hard to you know to figure out why you were there. Yeah, did um were most of your sermons bible based like what like what was the philosophical engine or like like framework that you know your sermons and well i yeah so we based. didn't do no exegesis and biblical um preaching is not a normative part of unitarian universalism um okay. There are a handful of congregations in New England where that might be true. Um, I like the Bible. I preached a lot out of it. The thing, I, ironically, I probably preached less from Buddhist themes than 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 most other you use because uh, um, you know because they knew who I was and and it, it was always important for them to for them to know that I knew that I was hired as their as their Unitarian minister, not as their Zen priest and uh, uh um so you know so ironically but it was good for me because it you know because i only you know you know uh well in seminary i can remember the reverend dr james chuck my homiletics professor uh, uh saying that the great preachers have three sermons uh, and it would behoove us all to figure out what our miserable one sermon is uh, is possible and you know my one sermon is always around turned on zen buddhism and and uh um um so finding other language you know not getting trapped in you know one metaphor uh was a great gift to, to me uh, loved, it, loved it um being being with people in hard times was powerful for me um i was never a good administrator i was a pretty good manager uh, and uh, um, and I was successful. You know, and, you know, they called me to large churches. You know, from after the after the second after, after out of the second one, second half of my career was all in big churches. All how um, so? It sounds like you're moving from parish to parish around the country. How are it, you? How are you able to maintain your koan practice? Having that uh, lifestyle? Well, initially, it was uh, two ways. Uh, initially, it was you know, mail, and that. Did not work. Uh, um, <clears throat> retreats mainly. You know, I just I was able to do a lot of retreats. I'd so you fly back to California for session, basically. I did. You know, on average, four session a year. Yeah. Would you Would you guys ever do Dokusan over phone or anything like that? We did a little bit of that. Neither of us was totally happy with it, but we. You know, especially, but once once I started, you know, when I was, you know, well into it, we would do that. Yeah, yeah. I I know some people do dokus on our. I, I can't even conceive of it because it's so much. So much of it is performative, you know. Um, that's why Zoom is kind of nice because yeah. it's not every sense involved, but but the visual, you know, I think crosses a line that makes it a lot more. And of yeah. course, my formal koan interest practice was all as a student was all pre Zoom. Yeah. So. Right. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about how you? Um, how the the genesis of boundless way how that came about um I, I, let's see i'm trying to remember when i first first arrived one of my colleagues in the uu world said oh they, there's a, a couple of zen teachers at at the worcester congregation and you know yes well, that's kind of cool and so i set up and you know met them and and um uh 
uh, one of them was actually a student of, of a guy named George Bowman, who was kind of a, a former member of the of the quantum school. And and the other was a student of Richard Clark, who was kind of a bandit Zen teacher. And, um, uh, um, the the one who had been part of the working with with Richard Clark realized she could could no longer work with him and quickly became my student. They had a lot of pre existing sitting group. There was another um, another um, and then also at the same about the same time I received a, actually a box of books and and from Wisdom Publications and the the and. The, follow up with a letter saying, I'm trying to contact teachers in the, in the uh, um, Harada Yasutani lineage. Uh, do you have a manuscript? And so I, I wrote, uh, yeah, I sent, sent off something and uh, I was, got back a letter said, this, this is kind of a pile of crap, but, but do you think maybe we could talk about my studying with you? <laughs> and with his name is Josh Bartok and, oh. and and he and then uh, uh, Rod Bead Sperry, uh, uh, um, they had a little sitting group that they were doing. And so, and then I started a sitting group in, in Newton, Massachusetts. And the, so those three groups kind of would evolve eventually into Boundless Way. And this is this post Darwin transmission, uh, your second one, your Inca, uh, I guess we could so say. When I was in Arizona, which was the second settlement, I, I was barreling in towards the end, beginning to get a good feel for this. And I was uh, in, in the, you know, in, in the Diamond Sangha style, I was made an apprentice teacher. Um, and, and then when I, by the time, when I got to Boston, I've been there a couple of, yeah, I forget how long I was there. I was given Inca, you know, uh, and um, um, so it was working, functioning as an independent teacher. Did you ever the, go visit? Shimano or Dido Lori when you're up in the Northeast? Um, I, I did meet uh, uh, both of them. Um, um, I met Dido because he invited me out to do, you know, he's always, he was like, you know, keeping that big institution afloat. He needed constantly having workshops and things. And they had me out to do uh, um, uh, Zen Buddhism for Unitarian Universalists. And, you know, it was kind of it was fun yeah and was, uh, so i got to do an interview with him and it was you know, kind of cool and and then when it, it later when uh um um geez uh getting old and you know names flowing out falling out of my head but uh uh the the current abbot of the of of of, of the you know, successor to uh you know, Shimano, Shimano. When, Shubi, Shubi, like um, um, when she was made a Roshi, mm -hmm. a specific Roshi thing, I, 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 and a couple of my students went up to, uh, uh, um, I think it was Syracuse and, uh, um, um, and, you know, watch the, it was a public ceremony and watch the, that and met, met the, the, um, uh, Edo Shimano, uh, you know, and I can see what, you know, I mean, he's a, you know, he was, yeah, I only knew him as a monster, you know, I mean, I, I mean, the rumors about him had been floating for years, um, but I also knew people and people I respected were, you know, his students and, and when I met him, I could see how that, you know, I mean, he's enormously charismatic, you know, um, um, you know, if he, if he wasn't a, a, a Roshi, he should have been a samurai, you know. Yeah. And and uh, so I can see how people, you know, you know, got pulled in, even when they knew you know, there's a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and when we talked about it earlier, there's there's often a huge um, split between having a clear Dharma eye and having psychological or social maturity. I, I, exhibit number one, you know, maybe you know, I mean, it seems like it, you know. Yeah, I mean, people wish that it were otherwise, but the reality is that, you know, you, we got a bunch of things that we have to work on to, to become full human beings. And, yeah, being good at cons is not enough. I'm curious. So let's say your your life, so it sounds like meeting Tarrant Roshi and doing the con curriculum, I, that seemed like it's been a pretty effective tool for you finding some degree of peace in your life and satisfaction and 
in spiritual fulfillment. Do you think it was um, the koans per se? Like, could like let's say your life took a slightly different turn and you wound up in the San Francisco Zen Center ecosystem. Do you think you, you could have had that spiritual resolution through just pure modern Soto just sitting? Or do you think the kind of the wisdom mining tools of koans, like is it something you kind of needed? Does that I, question make sense? Well, for, I can only speak for myself in that. I, 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 I needed koans. Uh, I really needed koans. I, I, I believe you can wake up without koans. Uh, I I needed koans. Uh, it worked for me. Um, it, you know, with all the caveats, um, it was it is the thread of my primary. It's the primary thread of my spiritual disciplines. Um, what is it about koans? Like, like you and I work on koans, so we're so there's a lot of implicit stuff, implicit stuff. But for someone who's not a koan student. What is it about Quans that captured you? What about the process was important to you and worked for you? I think it allowed me to focus in on what the what the matter was. When, you know, I had a question. You know, um, actually, it moved from um, "Is there a God?" to "What is God?" Um, but I needed, I you know, so that was always with me in some in some sense. Um, um, Zen knows how the Koan schools know how to take that question yeah, and, and, and work with it and and turn me you know in the directions to see what I needed to see and and once I had that insight you know then make sure it was really rooted and then from that to begin to you know you know show show me how how many one-sided views I had you know and it constantly pushed me you know yeah, you know, and you know, so even to this day, even though I don't formally, you know, well, I, I do cons all the time, but you know, on the other side of the, 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 the table, as it were, but but um, um, but it's also who I, you know, I mean, it's just simply, you know, how how I practice. Even though I would say I'm more pure land these days than I am Zen. I'm an old person, so you know, we all turn to the pure land, you know, eventually. Uh, um, yeah. um, I'm sort of I I you know I look at Jesus and I realize oh that's a meta yeah. Uh, so. Have you ever heard the metaphor where um, Buddhism is like a tunnel, Zen is one entrance of the tunnel, Pure Land is the other entrance, and eventually if you start on the Pure Land side, you wind up on the Zen part, and if you start in the Zen part, you wind up in the Pure Land part. Oh, I haven't heard that, but I but I definitely feel from the Zen side to into the into the pure land. I, I you know it's all a wonder at this point. I'm just enormously grateful. Um, so um, so you you've been a te fairly established teacher at this point. Um, has it um, like what what have you found? What has been fulfilling as being a teacher, and what has been what have you found to be challenges? Well, I think, um, you know, um, successes and failures, you know, um, that I've actually been able to accompany people as they have awakened and help them kind of get on the other, you know, through that has been good. Finding, you know, working with people for whom the wounds overtake them and, you know, um, you know, um, has been very painful and, and sad. And, I, and these days, I'm you know aware of where I've my own failings as a teacher. Uh, um, um, I'm more acutely aware of. Uh, so, so you know, it's an interesting place to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Do, um, what you know, in America, we have a very psychological, therapeutic, you know, view into reality. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the language people use. So when when people come to you as students, do you do you find them trying to make you their therapist? Often do you do you, and how do you deal with that? Um, um, there's a, that there's a little bit of that. That's okay. It's it's. I think the biggest issue I've discovered is that you know as I've aged and as students have been younger than me, um, you know, it's being it's being the fa being father. That's the the. the the more complicated and thorny issue. Yeah. Do you do you kind of use that as a skillful means, or do you just cut that off? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not real good at cutting things off, mm -hmm. uh, um, um, and I'm not very good at skillful means. Yeah. So I, 
keep I'm not sure if that's true. I keep coming back to the co-op, you know, and and encourage people to look at bigger pictures and you know be of service in some manner. Yeah, cool. So um, we're about an hour and fifteen minutes into. Do you want to? Are you feeling like you want to wrap it up, or do you want to go a little bit longer, or what do you think? I I, I can go a little longer, but I am an old person, so. Yeah. Yeah, we chatted a little bit before this started too, so I think we're closer to maybe two hours. Um, I'm curious where you kind of see what you've been pretty eloquent about, um, insightful, I feel, in your blogs about kind of the sociological aspects of Zan, you know, where it's been, where it's going. Like, can you talk a little bit about where where do you think this experiment is going? Like, you know, if if, if you had to guess, like, what do you think Zen's going to look like 100 years from now? Do you think it's going to be around? Do you think it's going to be thriving? Do you think it'll be smaller than it is now? Like, what what does your crystal ball tell you? Um, I I do believe Zen will be around. Uh, um, when my generation, as my generation is now beginning to die off, um, there's going to be a, a a dramatic shrinkage. A lot of centers that exist today will not exist in fifty years. Um, um, after after that, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, I'm intrigued by some of the things. I wish I had more time. I love the emergence of the Christian Zen community. I wish it was around when I was uh, in formation. I might have found a place there. Uh, um, you mean uh, like the Sambo Zen people? Like well, well they're, they're mostly people associate with Sambo Zen, but not not necessarily uh um but, but christians who practice zen and and the emerging communities that are arising out of out of that um, um very dynamic at this point and, and i i see some juicy things i don't know how it will how it will turn um um, um and that's the thing i don't know how it'll turn out but it, it but it is intriguing a thing i notice among um, some of the millennial practitioners is there's this small but significant back to japan thing uh, going where we're you know truthfully in the west you know in in north america if you want to be as you know zen teaching is part of your 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 scheme for yourself it's a 20-year project you know at least um you know you go to japan you spend uh, a year you know in a monastery and you're full full you got transmission um and a uh, a number of younger people have done that, you know, and they're, I find them, you know, quite interesting. Some of them I really like, you know, and, and um, um, ironically, even though, I mean, socially, they're quite progressive usually, but, but, you know, religiously, they're very conservative and, and it's an intriguing crowd. Uh, I, I, you know, I, you know, I find them attractive often uh, and I, I don't know what, what's going to happen there. Um, you, you know, Rinzai has had a rough time taking root here in the West. Um, there are some intriguing things going on. Um, I wonder, you know, I wonder how that will take shape. Um, so there's a, a lot of things. And and I realize that, you know, I mean, what, well, another thing I've, I've kind of figured out is if I if I say something's going to happen, the odds are pretty good that it's not, you know, hmm. but, yeah, it's all it's all not knowing. All right, is there uh, any last thing you'd like to address or, you know, kind of your your, your parting Zen words? <laughs> Wrong guy. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I love the tradition. I think it has something to offer. I'm glad to have had a small part in it and to, I hope, have a continuing uh, thread of, of connection for, for a while yet. Great. Thank, well, you. thank you so much. Um, if, uh, if someone wanted to get a hold of you, what's um, what's the? I, I know you're not taking on new students. You mentioned, but right. you know, let's say someone wants to be, maybe okay. have you recommend one of your students to them, or like what? What's the sure. best way for them to contact you? Well, there's two things. I mean, our community has a website. You know, so if you just look up emptymoonzen.org or Google Empty Moon Zen, um, <laughs> I have a professional page. You know, jamesishmailford.com. Uh, and there's a there's is Ishmael your given name or a Dharma name? I've always been confused by that. A nom de cult. It comes from my Sufi visits. A shake. Oh, okay. It means either he who God hears or he who hears God. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, and it's sort of, um, yeah, it, it's good marquee, and and yeah, it's become my, it's on all my diplomas and things. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate the time. Really a treat.